This is my 1999 Jeep Grand Cherokee WJ that I bought for $300. Now, it didn't really look this cool when I bought it, and it had to be trailered home because it wasn't even running. So, it's been on the channel a few times and I thought it was probably time I kind of told its story and, you know, explained how and why it's here and how it looks this way. So I bought this thing from the original owner. Uh, the Jeep was not running and it had about 160,000 miles on it. It had a engine issue and an electrical issue and the original owner had kind of decided that it was time to part ways with it because the cost to fix it was kind of exceeding the cost of the vehicle. So they were done with it, didn't know what to really do with it, and I you know, offered them a little bit of money because the engine issue could have been a really expensive issue, and it still can be. It's still kind of a ticking time bomb. I put it back together enough to make it run, and so far, it's been holding up. So let me kind of explain um, this is how it looked. I'll throw a picture up here. Completely stock, um, no lift, no cool wheels and tires, just how it came from the factory. And like I said, it had to be shoved onto the trailer to get drug home and dad and I actually pushed the thing off the trailer into the garage. It would crank, but not start. And these 4.7 liter engines are kind of known if they ever get hot, um, whether it be a radiator issue or a water pump issue, the steel valve seats that are pressed into the aluminum heads, they will drop out, hold the valve open long enough for the rocker arm to get kicked off and then they won't start, they won't run because they don't have either the intake or the exhaust valve opening. Typically at that time, it's time to replace the cylinder head because you've got a valve seat that has, you know, either dropped or it's dropped and then come back into the cylinder head. But either way, it's not a great thing to happen. Um, on a few of them in the past, I've gotten away with putting that rocker back in. But like I said, that's kind of a temporary fix because you know that valve seat could fall out kind of at any time or if it were ever to get hot again, the likelihood of that valve seat falling out is way, way high. So the correct replacement would be to replace the cylinder head, but these things are now getting old enough that Chrysler or Jeep have discontinued those cylinder heads. So you're really only left with aftermarket O'Reilly's AutoZone, that sort of thing to get parts for a new cylinder head. And then you're kind of left with quality of something aftermarket versus factory. So what I did, pulled the valve cover off and found which rocker had come off. Luckily, in this case, the valve seat had pushed itself back up into place. So I was able to loosen the camshaft, put that rocker back in, bolt it back down, put some new valve cover gaskets on, went to start it, and I still didn't get it to start. It would crank and not start. With the scanner, I was able to look and found that I didn't have any crankshaft position sensor signal. So started digging into wiring and found some chewed up or cut or chafed wiring at the crankshaft position sensor. So the thing actually had two things happen to it at the same time or shortly after. So pulled it back apart, repaired those wires, hit the key, and it fired up. And like I said, that was around 160,000 miles. And I have now had it for, gosh, a couple of years now and have around 180. So it's been driving fine, but like I said, you're always kind of sitting on that time bomb of that valve seat could drop and leave you stranded. So it's always in the back of my mind while I'm driving it, but so far, I've just really kept an eye on my uh, coolant temperature and made sure it has coolant and my fans are working, and so far it's been happy. So, that's kind of what got this thing moving again. Now, 
I originally bought this, like I said, for $300, and my plan was to keep a spreadsheet of every single dollar and penny I spent on this so I could really know, hey, I got this thing for $300 and I've spent $1,000 and look how cool it is and how good it off-roads. And that was a great idea and I kept with that for quite a while until that list got too long and the number at the bottom was too scary. So I crumbled the list up and threw it away because I didn't like looking at how much I had spent on this cheap Jeep that was only $300. So I continued doing cool, you know, cost effective upgrades and some kind of cool custom upgrades and um, has made it to what it is today. And it's honestly, for what it is, really, really good off road. These WJ99 through 04 Jeeps are pretty cheap. And because they just don't really have that aftermarket following or the aftermarket support that some of the other generations of Jeeps and Grand Cherokees do. So they're really kind of a good buy because you can, like I said, get them cheap, do a few things to them, and they work really well off-road. So I can kind of take you around this thing and show you some of the cool things that it has as factory features and then some of the cool off-road upgrades that I've done to help it do what it does off-road. So I was super lucky on how this thing was optioned from the factory. Um, it is just your basic Laredo trim, but it is a really high optioned Laredo. And by that, I mean you've got the 4.7 liter V8 and, you know, the Inline six is a great motor, makes good power, and is super reliable. But with that V8 option, you got 235 horsepower and 195 foot-pounds of torque versus that uh, inline six that had 195 horsepower and 230 foot-pounds of torque. So it's kind of a really cool, um, you know, option but like I said there's those downfalls with the cylinder heads that you've always kind of got to think about if you're looking at one of these uh, WJ's. This thing also is relatively high trim on the interior and by that I mean you've got this Jeep has leather you of course have the tape player because we're still in 1999 with this thing but when you come around to the back somebody was nice enough to option the factory 10 disc CD changer now I have never actually attempted to use it but surely the thing works and I don't know it's just kind of cool knowing it's back here and that somebody optioned that back in the day. Another really good thing that this did not get optioned was a sunroof. Um, a lot of these, you know, higher trim level Jeeps will have sunroofs, which are fine, but you've got sunroof drains that can clog and you've got, you know, moving parts that can break. So it's kind of nice not, or kind of nice knowing that I will never have to worry about a sunroof issue, a track, a motor leaks because it doesn't even have one. So that's one less thing to think about. Another kind of cool thing about buying a Laredo versus a Limited or Overland is you've got manual temperature control. And you may wonder, you know, what's the big deal going from the manual temperature control versus the auto temp control? The auto temp control on second gen Grand Cherokees are notorious for breaking doors. The doors inside the dash that open and close for heat will break really, really often. So it's super cool having the manual temp control that you know never breaks and always works. Some of the kind of cool 
things that I've thrown into this. This is a, like I said, a first year 1999 Grand Cherokee. I've got a set of 2001 limited white face cages. And like I said, it does nothing other than look really cool in the dash. Um, it's just kind of a, it adds a little bit of, bit of color to the dash versus just the black gauges that it came with. Another thing is later Grand Cherokee's got this kind of cool brushed aluminum trim that goes across, across the dashboard versus the kind of fake wood grain that would have come standard on this 99 Laredo. So I've pulled all of that wood grain and put the what I think is better looking brushed aluminum trim. So that's kind of another cool little upgrade. Another thing on these Grand Cherokees is that overhead console. Um, there are some of them that have tire pressure sensors, some of them that have sunroof switches, the home link buttons for the garage door openers, and they're all really cool because you can plug and play. If you go to a salvage yard and find one that has tire pressure sensors or the home link buttons, you can unplug yours and plug the different one right in. And mine originally did not have the home link buttons for garage doors. So I found one at my local salvage yard, bought it and threw it in here. So it's kind of cool being able to add some factory um, options that the Jeep didn't originally have. So that's kind of a cool thing as you're looking at buying one of these 99 through 04 Jeep Grand Cherokees. And here is where all the magic happens or the bad magic, depending on how broken or not your Grand Cherokee is. This is the big 4.7 liter V8 that the second gen Grand Cherokees got. The original first gen Grand Cherokees had the 5.2 liter or the 5.9 liter but these 4.7 liters are just such a better motor, a lot less leaks and a lot less issues than those older 5.2 and 5.9 um, engines. And they just run really well. But like I said, you've got a couple issues. You've got those cylinder head issues and these do have timing chains, which is typically great. But as these get higher mileage, they do start wearing those timing chain guides and start making a little bit of noise on startup. But that is something you could address if you were taking those cylinder heads off to replace or um, repair those. And I have not done too much under the hood of this. Um, one thing I have done, you can take a look back here and see the throttle body right back here behind the air box. The early 99 and 2000 Grand Cherokees got a smaller 65 millimeter throttle body and the later ones got a big, huge 68 millimeter throttle body. So I also went to the same salvage yard, found a, um, that larger throttle body and bolted that on, you know, who knows if it did anything, but it, it can't hurt. So that's, you know, a, another, easy kind of cheap mod that you can do to help these old things move down the road a little bit better. Now, another thing to look at on these, there was a couple of different transfer case options on these. There was a select track transfer case, a quadra drive transfer case, and a quadra drive two transfer case. And they all kind of mean different things. That select track is what this Jeep now has. It originally had a quadra drive which you are left with all-wheel drive neutral and four low options and that is great for most people that don't want to have to think about it you can get in drive it if it's snowy rainy it doesn't matter it's going to go ahead and work by itself for you i wanted the select terrain or excuse me select track option which is super, super rare for V8 Jeeps. It came behind most of the inline six Jeeps. And what that allows you to do is select two wheel drive. I can show you here. You've got two wheel drive, four wheel drive, part-time, full-time, neutral, and four low. And the coolness of that is being able to go into two wheel drive and, you know, 
spin the tires if you want to go and have fun and play with it. But in an off-road situation, if you were to break a front drive shaft or a rear drive shaft with that quadra drive transfer case, you're going to be dead in the water. You can't lock the center differential and you wouldn't be able to drive out. If you were even, you know, if you were able to unbolt that drive shaft and take it off, you're still stuck. But with this, you could lock it in four wheel drive and pull that drive shaft out and drive out in front wheel drive or rear wheel drive and at least be able to get yourself off the trail. So it's just a lot better transfer case. So I was able to get with one of our local um, salvage yards, LKQ, locate the 242HD specific transfer case that I wanted that came behind the V8s. And it was out of our Topeka location, so they were able to send one down and they are a direct bolt-in. You do have to get the rear drive shaft for that transfer case because the yoke is even larger. It's just a heavier duty transfer case. So with the transfer case and the rear drive shaft, it bolts in and you don't even have to change your shifter bezel. I was able to find one also so it could look factory like it should have. And everything works like it should and it's just kind of cool having another option for you know, two wheel drive versus that all wheel drive that it came with. So let's take this thing out on the road and let me kind of explain why I love driving this thing and it's honestly probably my favorite vehicle that I own. And I've got some other cool stuff, but I really, really like driving this thing. So, um, this, before it was lifted and modified, of course drove and rode even better, but even still with the lift, it drives and rides so nice. I, it's just a really comfortable vehicle. We've jumped in this thing and driven all the way to the lake four and a half hours away. And it's, it's just a really comfortable vehicle. You've got room in the back for cargo. You've got a full second seat that's not cramped. It's just a really, really nice vehicle for road trips. If you can get over the whole thought in the back of your head that you're driving a 1999 vehicle five hours away from your house and it's gonna be a long walk home if and when it does break and you bought it broken. But besides all of that, great, reliable vehicle. Um, the seats on a second gen Grand Cherokee are super soft and supple and you know, these are old enough vehicles. You've got the big thick foam, it's not, you know, solid sporty seats that you get in the later third gens and fourth gens. These are just nice, soft, supple seats. And honestly, the cloth seats are probably even softer because the leather is, you know, a little bit firm, but they just are so comfortable. Um, this being a relatively high trim level or optioned Jeep, you've got power, um, seat, power, lumbar, all that kind of cool stuff that you would be expecting in a newer, more modern vehicle, and you've got all that. The 4.7 liter has plenty of power, um, you know, merging, getting on the highway. Obviously, it has a little bit less power now that I've got larger tires on it, but still, um, still moves really, really well. This one, luckily, has the factory trailer tow package, so it got the deeper 373 gear ratio. So that's kind of another benefit of this Jeep is how perfectly it was optioned. You've also got a decent sized 20 gallon gas tank on the second gen Grand Cherokee, so you still have pretty decent range, even with a little bit worse gas mileage once you're lifted with big heavy wheels and tires. So. They're just a really kind of a cool, unpopular Jeep because the aftermarket support isn't really there, but they just they just are really nice vehicles. This one with 182,000, it actually just rolled over 182,000 as we were talking. This one has a few rattles, a few squeaks on the interior plastic, which honestly, I probably just need to have someone else drive it and me crawl around in the back, figure out what panels are loose or rattly, and I could probably fix 90% of any little squawks and rattles that are left in this Jeep 
and it would be just about perfect. Um, this also has the Infinity Gold option sound system, and honestly, it sounds amazing still. Even though the speakers are however many years old now, it is one of the best sounding vehicles that I've got. Um, it, it just works well, sounds well, and has decent bass, even for something without a dedicated subwoofer. And I'm no big audiophile, but it does sound really, really well. Now, being it only has a tape player up here in the front and that 10 disc CD changer in the back, I've got the tape adapter so you can hook up to your phone, stream Pandora, stream Spotify, whatever you want to do, and it works really, really well. And that's why I definitely, you know, wouldn't do any radio upgrade on it because it works good and it looks the part of a, you know, late 90s radio with it flowing with the dash. Now this being lifted, you do feel a little more of the bumps in the road, but it, it really is not bad. I've really kind of put thought into what suspension parts I put on it and wanting to make sure I had the, you know, nice components on it, but still be cost effective. Um, once we get back to the garage, I'm going to kind of go through some of those suspension mods that I've done with this thing and uh, kind of explain my thoughts and reasons behind each part and piece that I put on and why they're on there. But like I said, I just really, really love driving this thing. It is one of my favorite vehicles that I have. It's not fast. It's not expensive, but man, I really, really enjoy driving it. Um, the few times when I've driven the truck daily or whatever, I just am always really excited to get back into this thing and drive it. Just because it's a little bit unique, a burgundy Grand Cherokee that is lifted up a little bit and it, it just really surprises people off-road with how well these things do. So let's get back to the garage and if you're still hanging on with me this long into the video, we'll do some crawling around under this thing and I will show you some of the kind of cool parts that I've put on it and some of the parts that I've modified to work even better off-road. So there is one thing on this Jeep that's still kind of broken and definitely not easy to fix. And it's got a bit of a smoking problem. And by that I mean... Yeah, that's not smoke because it's cold outside. That's smoke because the valve stem seals have left the vehicle. That's one thing on these 4.7 liter Jeeps that is pretty common and almost guaranteed to happen. As they get higher mileage, those valve stem seals get worn and then you start burning oil. So I didn't know this had the issue. Uh, drove fine, no smoke, no nothing, until I decided to um, remove something on the exhaust that may have been catching that oil and burning it because the catalytic converter on these is huge and massive and hangs down really far and we've found off-road that they get caught on rocks so you can install a 2004 mid-pipe off of a V8 Grand Cherokee and that basically gets rid of that rear catalytic converter so you have a little bit more room off-road. So now that we are underneath this thing, you can see we've got some cool Bilstein shocks for that two inch lift. You know, we've got adjustable control arms to fix the caster angle. We've also got an iron rock off-road high clearance cross member, which you gain almost two full inches of ground clearance with going from that factory cross member to that aftermarket cross member. 
and which left my transfer case really hanging down out in the open. So I found a Rusty's off-road transfer case skid plate and bought it and immediately started chopping it apart because it is supposed to work with that factory cross member, which means it from the factory when you bolt it on hangs all the way down here, but that would have completely made my cool cross member irrelevant. So I came back to where it mounts to the body, chopped it in half, moved it up and forward to gain all of that ground clearance that I had gotten from that cross member, but that left my transfer case hitting the bottom of that skid plate. So I chopped a big window in the bottom of it and welded a bunch of plate to make that small area that hangs down in just the right area for that transfer case to poke through. So it's really, really strong, it's solid, and you've gotten all that ground clearance back. We can also take a look at that. Here is that mid pipe that we were talking about because normally in this section, there's gonna be a big, massive catalytic converter hanging down just behind the cross member. And that thing is such a large diameter that it hangs down and will hit, you know, rocks if you're actually using this thing. And as you can tell from all the scrapes and scratches, it does definitely get used off-road. We can also see that slightly wet, but that is that transfer case, that 242HD um, that got me the cool two-wheel drive option so I can have a few more you know, options with it when I'm off-roading or on-roading. We've also got adjustable rear control arms because those Control arms were getting a little bit tired, the bushings were kind of worn, and you know, you start to get a little bit of play in the rear suspension. So those got replaced. Another thing you need to do on a Grand Cherokee, or at least a second gen Grand, there is that spacer on top of the rear axle between the axle and the control arm. That helps get your rear ball joint and your rear bushings in the correct angle so you're not putting extra wear on them and causing those to go out any quicker than they should. So if we come around to the front, this has a bumper cut and basically you cut off anything that hangs below the you know kind of grill opening there at the bottom and that helps you not hang up on rocks and ledges as you're going up and down them off road and the next part that kind of hangs down is the factory radiator cross member which you can see what's left of it here that has been cut off this is an aftermarket radiator support that bolts into place and moves that factory mount almost two inches higher. Now, it definitely requires cutting and modifying because you are cutting the factory radiator support off the vehicle and bolting this one back on. You also then lose any way to mount your tow hook. So I cut and modified that aftermarket bracket to be able to fit the factory tow hook so I could still kind of retain the look that it is still stock. If we roll under the front here, you will see those JL sway bar links that we had a video on a while back and how perfectly those things fit and our JL steering dampener that has obviously taken the beating off road but still works great. But once you get all of that up out of the way, you just have a ton of front ground clearance on a WJ. The last thing I threw on up front here is a JKS adjustable track bar because once you get over two inches, your axle is gonna be pretty off center and you're gonna need to center that and that's what an adjustable track bar is for. 
Another kind of cool upgrade that you can do on a lot of Jeeps, not just a Grand Cherokee, but these are JK Wrangler wheels. These are 07 through 18 Jeep Wrangler sport wheels. And they honestly, at least in my opinion, look super cool on a WJ. Um, so on the street, I've got my nice, clean, not chewed up, five spoke Wrangler wheels running a, see if you can see, a 255 70 17 Falcon Wild Peak. And at least with that size, it's still small enough that you're not gonna completely dog the vehicle down and it at least looks the part of kind of a cool all-terrain tire. But when we get ready to go off-roading, we've got, again, the same five-spoke Wrangler wheels, but we've got a 255-75 R17, and that is a factory Jeep Wrangler Rubicon tire size, and that's the factory mud train. So we've got these things lined up ready for whenever we go off-roading, we're able to throw those on and have some more traction. But guys, I could honestly probably talk for hours and hours about different cool little factory upgrades that you can do on these things. I really, really got a passion for one, Jeeps. I work on them every day at work, but two, these old WJs. They just aren't really respected out there in the Jeep world, but they are such a good buy. Um, you've got to watch for some rust on them in a few places, but they're just a really, really good buy for what they are, and they're just a really nice vehicle to daily drive. So, if you guys are still watching, this probably means you've got a WJ or you've fallen asleep and your computer is still rolling, but if you've got any specific WJ questions or you know, want to know, I can shoot you a link on where I got the specific, you know, radiator skid plate or the cross member. If you've got a WJ and want any specific questions, hit me up in the comments and I will try to get back with you relatively quickly. Or if you want a video on anything else more in depth, then I can definitely get that going. But I'm gonna go ahead and cut it here because this is gonna be a long video and I will catch you guys next time. Thanks for watching. Yeah, that's, that's not a good thing. Not a good thing at all.